All right. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, first, uh, first full day of the conference. Really excited to be here. Really excited to have so many folks here. Uh, as you may or may not have noticed, I am not Matt Stein. Um, so addressing that quickly, there were some questions about this, and I figure yeah, it might be worth talking about this with uh, everybody. But basically, uh, this, it turns out, is a topic that uh, Matt Stein and I have been collaborating on for, for quite some time. Uh, I've been on my uh, personal knowledge management journey, digital knowledge management, digital personal knowledge management. Boy, this is producer. all right. Maybe one more sip of coffee and then I'll try this again. Uh, you know, I've been on this uh, digital knowledge management journey for quite some time. And, and, I'm, and I eventually kind of found a set of tools and, and approaches that started to work for me. And I was very wary of changing tools because I am acutely aware how some of these things turn into a rabbit hole and how you can spend all of this, all of your time obsessing about the tools to the detriment of the effects that you wanna create, the, the, the benefits you wanna get from the tools. But uh, Matt finally convinced me to switch over to LogSeq uh, about a year ago. And I know there's a no number of other uh, no fluff, just stuff speakers who have been obsessing over this tool as well. Um, and you know, Matt makes it to a few of the shows. I make it to a lot more of the no fluff road shows. And so we, we talked and kind of agreed, you know, uh, we can share this topic because we, uh, we're both passionate about learning this stuff and passionate about kind of sharing the different ways that it's benefited us. So I was planning to launch this talk in 2023, uh, going into the new year. I had about, I'd say about two thirds of it written. And when I found out that uh, Jay needed a sub for Matt on this topic, I said, well, you know what, let's, let's dive in and finish it. And I was able to collaborate with Matt and bring in a lot of his most salient points. And it's, it's been kind of interesting because, you know, we tell the same story from, a, from different directions. Uh, we, we kind of preach a lot of the same workflow. So, uh, so I, I really believe you're gonna get a lot of the, the same key information. And my hope is that this talk inspires you to adopt some practices with or without the tools uh, that, that, that start to benefit you. Uh, so I've, I, like I said, we've collaborated quite a bit. I've incorporated a lot of his message into mine. Uh, I've got a lot of my story in here, and uh, uh, I, I genuinely feel kicking this off, uh, this this new collaborative version that that we have the best of both worlds. And it started with this problem. You know, I, I, I talk about this from time to time. I've talked about this for quite a while. Uh, when I was younger, I got, I, I was diagnosed with ADD. This is back in the 80s. And I feel like I have to point this out because, uh, you know, the important takeaway here is that I had my diagnosis before it was cool. Okay. <laughs> and, and this was just always a struggle for me. And, and as much as it's been a struggle for me, I realized that I'm not alone. Uh, all this time, you know, we go out, we learn things and, and, there's nothing worse than that feeling in a moment that you know something, but you can't recall it. Um, it's, it's just not coming back from your mental cold storage or you wrote something down and you don't know where to find it. Uh, my life is full of notebooks that have a lot of important information that I wrote down. I have no idea what's where, I have no idea which notebook, where to find it. It's there. Uh, sometimes I look back on my day and I just feel exhausted and I don't know what I've done or I get, get to like a quarterly review. And they're like, you know, just, just, you know, give me the highlights of uh, what you've been up to the last quarter. And then I start going through sent emails and scrolling back through like Teams chats and stuff like that. It's just a miserable experience. Um, sometimes it's just that structure that's missing. You know, you know, there's a lot of things to do and you have this sort of nebulous cloud of, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this other thing and you don't know where to start. And you just kind of get more and more overwhelmed and time passes and that just makes things worse and you have even less time and more overwhelm. Uh, and it's just hard to get started sometimes, you know, it's like an object at rest tends to remain at rest or you want to build your knowledge portfolio in a scalable practical way. And this group right here and here on Zoom as well is definitely what, what I would call a self-selecting group. You know, these, you are the type of people that, uh, that, that, that attend conferences that are going to sit in these sessions. And there's a real problem with a lot of this. A lot of these sessions are lecture style. Some of them are labs, some of them are interactive where we do katas and things like that. But 
Um, two weeks, we tend to remember only 20% of what we hear. And you know there's a lot of gold in that other 80%. And you're even gonna have that nagging feeling that I remember speaker XYZ talked about this, but if you don't have some way to get that back when you need it, then you're, you're gonna spend a lot of your time just searching and scrambling, and it's just not a great place to be. So I already mentioned this, I'm not Matt Stein, I am Michael Carducci. Uh, I live somewhere at the intersection between magic and technology. And, and for me, professionally, the magic that I'm most interested in these days surrounds turning data into information and information into knowledge. So I work as an independent consultant. I help my clients with knowledge management projects. And I, I spend a lot of time helping clients with the architecture and implementation of knowledge systems. So I do a lot of research and development in the knowledge graph space. And I've long dreamt of applying these ideas at a personal scale uh, to manage my own needs. It's like, wow, if I had something like this, you know, I've got clients with enterprise knowledge graphs, but if I had something like that, that would be cool. Uh, basically to not only allow me to capture what I learned, but be able to find it again when I need it. And it turns out uh, other people have beat me to it. Uh, I, we stand on the shoulders of giants and by adopting the ideas of the people who came before us, um, their tools and their ideas inspired my work and my learning my workflows in ways that I couldn't have even begun to imagine. So in this session, I'm gonna introduce the tools I use. I'm gonna share the details of my workflow. I'm gonna spend quite a bit talking about uh, Tiago Forte's uh, building a second brain methodology because uh, honestly, that's probably the most impact impactful book that I've read this year. And going into 2023, I have levels, unprecedented levels of optimism because I know with these tools, not only can I execute at my very best, I can, uh, I can do so without the anxiety that has plagued me for almost all of my life because I'm working on this, but not that. And what about these other things languishing over there? And how do I prioritize this, keep track of all this? And, and how do I not spend all my time in thrash mode looking for those rare things that, just, that I don't recall long enough and often enough to be able to just have top of the mind? Now, I will say, I mentioned this before, and it can become a rabbit hole that we go into. Uh, it's uh, really easy to obsess over the tools. Uh, and like I said, to the detriment of the, the, uh, the, the desired result. And in fact, we could spend an eternity evaluating all of the different tools out there, learning them all, hacking together in some kind of weird, some, some sort of way. But the key ultimately is to find some sort of balance. Uh, now, I think just Apple Notes is a little too simplistic for me. Uh, a whole hack together Rube Goldberg device of, of tools and knowledge management and notes and, and everything is a little too much for me. I want to I want to find the sweet spot, and maybe that's just one standard deviation out. I don't know, but uh, it's like Neil Ford is fond of saying: meta work is always more interesting than real work. And don't turn this into meta work. Make this make this more effective. Make make this help you become more effective. And here's the most beautiful thing: yes, there's a ton of tools out there. There's there's LogSeq. There's Rome. There's Obsidian. There's Evernote. There's all of these different things out here. Uh, the key is to pick one thing and get started. I started with something called foam that I'm going to talk a little bit about later on. Uh, but the key thing for me that, that helped me get over that fear and the FOMO was, look, I'm just writing markdown files. I'm writing markdown files that I'm storing on my computer and committing to a Git repo. So that means I've got some built-in portability. I didn't choose. I, I, I avoided the vendor lock-in anti-pattern. And uh, when it came time to evolve my workflow and evolve my tooling, I just moved everything over. In fact, if you look at my actual log seek graph today, the title of it is still foam knowledge, knowledge base or foam, whatever, uh, foam knowledge workspace or something like that is, is actually what it's called because I literally just moved all of my, all of my files into, uh, into my log seek pages and went, moved on with my life. Uh, the key is to, is to get started and evolve over time not to try to be perfect out of the gate. It's a, it's a case of mindset over tool set. Don't get caught in the trap of perfectionism, insisting that you have to have the perfect app with a precise set of features before you take a single note. It's about having a reliable set of tools that you can depend on, knowing you can always change them later. So lots of stuff I wanna talk about. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey. 
Um, I'm going to talk about some history of the ideas that that have been that have been percolating and and have reached their tipping point. Uh, how we've put all these pieces together. I'm going to introduce Logseek. Talk a little bit about my workflow. I'm going to talk about some of the capabilities of the app. Uh, my goal is not to give you an exhaustive tour of the product. I want to give you enough knowledge to get started. The the app that the, the app is incidental. The 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 rest of what we're talking about is the is the real meat. So I want to give you enough knowledge of the app to start playing around, to find it useful, some ideas of of where to start, so you don't look at a blank page and uh, and get overwhelmed by that. And then I'm going to talk uh, talk about uh, Tiago's building a second brain workflow uh, using Logseek. But again, you can apply these ideas anywhere. Uh, starting with my journey, I mentioned this before that early diagnosis is of ADD. Uh, you know, in the 80s, we didn't know that much about it. And they told me, they said, you'll probably grow out of it. Mm -hmm. And then as I got a little older, I said, you know what, I've probably grown out of this. And really what had happened was I had grown accustomed to the chaos that was my life, you know, to the extent I just thought it was normal. And then I then I was in a, a, a more serious relationship for one of the first times. And my partner at the time said, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but this isn't normal. Yeah, it is. You're just like, you know, seeing behind the curtain. You know, everybody's got chaos and mess and whatever with like this. And they're like, not like this. And I got another diagnosis. And I remember that because uh, I, I, so I finally got another diagnosis. I started seeing a doctor and, and we did the test again, you know, with 20 years of, uh, uh, 20 years more knowledge on the subject. And there's five categories I'm scored on and four of them are up there's like a red line on the on the results graph and then like four of my results are above the red line one's like down pretty low and that's the hyperactivity uh metric was the one where i was like 54th percentile and i said oh that red line is that the diagnostic threshold and he says no that's the 98th percentile <laughs> i'm like cool so i'm above average he says this is not where you want to be above average and um and, you know, but it was it was always this goal of of uh, seeking order for my chaotic brain. I remember going to school. the The teachers used to cry at the parent teacher conferences and say, "He's he has so much potential. If only he would apply himself." And um, you know, I, I learned some interesting things looking back. But uh, but in the '90s. When I was going to school, I had an obsession. In the early 90s, I wanted a Newton message pad. And, uh, you know, I, not likely. I grew up in a fairly, fairly humble household. Uh, the price of the Newton message pad when it launched, adjusted for inflation, was $1,500. Um, this is a pretty high-end tech gadget. Uh, and yeah, I wanted a gadget. I was I was very much a young geek, and I loved playing with computers. I loved playing with technology. But what I really wanted was a better memory, because I go to school and I would take notes. But my notebook turned out to be whatever scrap of paper happened to be handy in that moment, or whatever page. You know, some people they have notebooks that are that that have sections and they're color coded and they have tabs and they're like super organized and they spend hours on this meticulous system. I am not one of those people. If it doesn't happen automatically, it doesn't happen. And so, so I, I just had an ADD filing system and I didn't have any kind of useful index. So the extent of the value of me taking notes was whatever additional like mental reinforcement I got from writing those things down as I go. And after that, it's gone. It's out of sight, out of mind. And you know, then I'd have to study and I, I, I know that everything's in there somewhere, but I can't find anything. And I was convinced that technology would be the solution. Uh, but of course it wasn't yet at this time. And, and let's be honest, if I had gotten a Newton message pad, I would have just, I just have, I would have traded uh, thoughts and musings from being scattered across random pieces of paper to scattered across digital files. And of course, I've been in technology long enough to now to know that search is hardly a solved problem. Uh, not only that, the handwriting recognition would have been a major bottleneck. 
Um, and it would have just gotten in the way, it would have been friction for the thinking and learning that I wanted to do. Maybe you remember this classic gem. So I've come up with these academic alerts. You will receive one as soon as your grades start to slip in any subject. This way, your parents won't have to wait until report card time to punish you. Oh, innovative. I like it. Hey, Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. So even though I never got my hands on that scribble thing, as Steve Jobs derisively called it, uh, I did eventually start taking notes on computers. Uh, for a while, I used apps like OneNote and their ilk, and I still have all of my OneNote notepads, and somewhere I've got archived Evernote notebooks and, uh, and, and, and whatever some knockoffs of some of these things are at different points. Um, and I have a sea of scattered digital notebooks and pages and thoughts. Now, the freeform capabilities of something like this was cool though. I could draw, I could drop in pictures, I could drop in video, I could just put things. It, 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 I, I had multimedia capabilities. It was, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was probably a little too free form for my brain. Um, and, and again, you know, there was uh, research from Microsoft came out because we a lot of us have things like this. And we know we have good things in there. But again, it's that it's being able to get it back when you need it uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, Microsoft found out that uh, US employees on average spend 76 hours per year looking for misplaced notes, items and files. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was another study that uh, uh, there was there was another study came out that basically says that a quarter of a typical knowledge workers day is spent just looking for and consolidating information. And we only find what we're looking for about half the time. And, you know, 60, 70 years ago, Vannevar Bush was, before the digital revolution was, was, uh, uh, was commenting on this. We can enormously extend the record, yet in its present bulk, we can hardly consult it. There may be millions of fine thoughts in the account of the experience on which they're based, if one school scholar can only get one a week by diligent search, his synth synthesis are not likely to keep up with the current scene. And there's a, there's a study that, that was in the New York Times that we're consuming, I think it was 36 gigabytes of information a day. And we've gone from, and this is so, so it's gotten much, much worse since Vannevar Bush's time. He wrote that in 1945. And so I wanted a little bit more structure. And on my journey, I found a tool called Workflow. And it, it gave my notes a lot more structure that I could kind of organize ideas naturally into thoughts and subthoughts, uh, goals and tasks and subtasks. Uh, I could plan out my work. Uh, I can click on one of these bullets and focus in just on that present area. Um, and it allowed me to switch fairly seamlessly between digression and convergence, right? There's two phases whenever we're trying to create something. There's this, there's this divergent phase where we're just like doing research and gathering all this stuff and just like widening our view of this entire field. But we want to turn it into something, whether it's a, a presentation or an architecture or, or an idea or a proposal or an RFC or whatever else, uh, we need to converge back in. And uh, this is a tool that made it easy for me to do that. Uh, another thing that, uh, uh, that I really liked about this tool is I'm not always a linear thinker. And, and I'll switch back and forth constantly between breadth and depth. You know, I'll be spitballing on breadth and then suddenly I'll just dive down, in, down deep into that. And just the structure of these blocks with workflow, it made it really easy to do that. But I ran into limitations on cross-linking. Like I, I, I'd have to come up with some convoluted tagging system to start connecting ideas together. And that was, that was one of the limitations. I, I, I think I still pay for workflow probably, but I don't think I've logged in in five years. So maybe, maybe not. Maybe all the credit cards I've used have finally expired. Uh, and I remember in the 2000s, I, I ran into this problem. And this is another common problem that we have. And this is, and this is a key for things that we should keep in our, in our second brain. Was there were tasks 
that I do every single day. And because of that repetition, they were just locked into the steel trap. But then there were things that would happen only occasionally. Like when I first set up a new machine, I'm gonna spend the next day or two pounding my head against the table, trying to get all the little tools in there, get the environment set up, uh, get my build working, all the rest of this. And then once it works, it just kind of works. And then it's, I'm not gonna have to come back to this until I, uh, until I, I have to build a new machine again or somebody else joins the team or whatever. And it's like, I know that I can do this, but I'm basically starting from scratch. And instead of remembering how to do it, I'm trying to remember how I found the solution on Google or whatever else. So I built this little access database. Uh, again, it was a long time ago, forgive me. And, um, and, I was, and it was gonna be a place where I could store little facts or references or code snippets uh, for easy recall. Um, but the challenge was I didn't have any good way to organize it. So I had no good way to find it again. And, and that was really problematic. That was, that was probably my first foray into knowledge management, knowledge modeling and knowledge retrieval. And it was harder than I thought. And again, by many decades, Vannevar Bush beat me to it. Our ineptitude, and he's also much more eloquent than I am. Our ineptitude in getting at the record is largely caused by the artificiality of the systems of indexes. When data of any sort are placed in storage, they are filed alphabetically or numerically, and information is found when it is by tracing it down from subclass to subclass. Having found one item, moreover, one has to emerge from the system and re-enter on a new path. Now, as human beings, our minds operate on multiple associations, and there are these little mental cross-references everywhere. And I wanted to be able to, to store and track and keep track of what I know in a more natural way. Now, in the early 2000s, I stumbled on something called Everything Too. It is a fascinating sort of proto wiki uh, that still occupies its own little corner of the web. Uh, there's some interesting content on there. Uh, and I mean interesting, and I mean interesting. Um, there's everything is there. Um, uh, it's an interesting rabbit hole to fall into for sure. If you've never been, I would say that everything2.com is to Wikipedia what the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is to the Encyclopedia Galactica, because uh, there are many omissions. There is much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate. Um, it is, well, let me put it a different way. Uh, I found some memes. I'm gonna explain it in memes. Wikipedia, right? Uh, everything too is more like, what would happen if Pinocchio said, my nose will be growing? And like, that's the kind of stuff that's in there. Um, now, so I wrote a few write-ups back in the day, 2004, I wrote this write-up on what a card location style of card trick was, a lot of cross links in there. Um, and what's the, the way their system works, they're not so interested in uh, the notability guidelines or citing your, uh, or referencing your citations or anything like that. They just care if it's cool or not. So if I write a little haiku about the topic and, and somebody says that's cool and gets a lot of that's cool, then it stays. And if it doesn't, it just sort of atrophies away. But what was most interesting about everything too and why it can become a rabbit hole is underneath every write-up or collection of write-ups on a topic, there's something called the soft links table. And their idea was they wanted to approximate sort of a mental, a mental model of cross-references. Uh, they wanted to, to approximate thought processes similar in concepts to Jason Rover's Tangle Proxy. And so at the bottom of every node, uh, which is what they call a topic, uh, there's up to 64 soft links. They're two-way two links. And the way these get created is if I'm reading a node and it makes me think of something else and I go there, it tracks that link, just connects them. And if I'm reading this, and it makes me go somewhere else, then it tracks that connection. Now, obviously this is very vulnerable to trolling. Um, and, and as a result, uh, you will be sur surprised because like the soft links table is probably where you're going to uh, uh, get some kind of like trip some firewall proxy filter thing at work. Some of these are very much uh, not safe 
for work. But it was interesting. Right? They were trying to approximate this inherent cross-linking nature of our brain that emerged in our notes. And it turns out that idea wasn't new. So there's some, some history. And we're going to go all the way back to 1945. I mean, we could go way back to the 16th century, to uh, the first system of cards that were, that were just little thoughts. And, and there was a, a, a system where, we would, where these cards would be connected. Now, you could talk about the commonplace book where people had their, their little personal knowledge, uh, their personal, their second brain in a form of a physical book. It was called a commonplace book. In the 16th century was the first idea of getting these cards and creating systems of cross references. So you can explore this in a very analog way, but uh, that became the Zettelkasten in the 1950s. But going all the way back to 1945, Vannevar Bush wrote, an, wrote a visionary essay in the Atlantic, and it was called As We May Think. And he described a hypothetical tool called the Memex. Now, there were certain things that were hard to imagine in 1945, like transistors were hard to imagine in 1945, and, uh, and digital computers, all of this. So, so he kind of imagined that this would all work via like microfiche, and, and that we would store everything and like microfiche, and, and you'd have this elaborate desk that would do these things. But at its core, a Memex is a device where an individual stores all of his books, all of his records and communications that's mechanized so it can be consulted with exceeding speed and accuracy. And what's most interesting about it was there was a, a built-in mechanism for associative indexing. So if I'm looking at something and I wanna connect two things, you can just press a lever or a foot pedal or something like that. And, and it would tie these two things together. And that was the important thing. And it was through this machine that Bush hoped to transform an information explosion into a knowledge explosion. Now, about a year after this was published, a, um, a young Douglas Engelbart read it and it inspired him. And he says, and, and it drove a lot of his work. And in the, in the early 1960s, Douglas Engelbart started uh, a little uh, research, uh, a, a research project with a, a small team trying to bring some of these ideas to reality. You know, how can we use technology to make this marvelous machine happen? And, um, and it, it, it culminated in what has become known December 9th. Uh, we, are, we are just past the anniversary of the mother of all demos. And uh, that was, that's what this, uh, this little article was about where he demoed these ideas that have shaped everything, so many things that we do today. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, this is, this is probably one of the most important pieces of, of modern computing history, and it's on YouTube, which is just incredible. So what did he demo in the mother of all demos? Well, he, he demoed the first mouse and uh, cursor pointer on a computer, corded keyboards, which never really took off outside of stenography, a graphical user interface, multiple windows, this whole Windows model, a windowing model, the desktop metaphor, uh, integrated text and graphics, multimedia on a computer, networking, real-time collaboration. Basically in the 1960s, he was demoing the things that we do today effortlessly with stuff like Google Docs, video conferencing, context sensitive help and navigation, version control, dynamic file linking, outline, uh, uh, outline processing, object oriented programming and hypermedia. That I can, I can have a document and connect it to something else, connect that to something else and connect that to something else. And, and in a 1995 interview with Douglas Engelbart, he said he wanted to turn Vannevar's Bush's idea of a Memex into reality where a machine uh, could, where, where a human could use that machine interactively and they could augment their intelligence. And this in turn inspired another visionary. In 1980s, based on that early work in hypertext, uh, Tim Berners-Lee created something called Inquire in 1980. And it was something, it was like a hypertext database system that was something like a wiki. And he saw the same problem. We have tons and tons of information here at CERN. We have all the results of all this research. We have all these different projects going on. We have people coming and going and we're losing this. It's here. It's insanely valuable and we can't get it. And so in 1989, he wrote a proposal for, uh, for a network hypertext system. 
that uh, that can allow us to publish and cross-link documents and ideas and things and data and connect information systems. And uh, that became the World Wide Web. And of course, the web grew and it developed on top of the architecture of the World Wide Web because the web that we know today was this much of Sir Tim Berners-Lee's vision. Like the web of documents was just the beginning. The full vision was starting with a web of documents. That's like the MVP. And then getting webs of data, webs of information, machine readable information, and machine and, and webs of machine and human interpretable knowledge. And that work continued. And so as a result, there are some really incredible tools that are, that are in the wild, solving problems, uh, dealing with knowledge management at massive scale. But, um, you know, essentially the pieces are in place and there's a whole lot more, um, uh, there's a whole lot more uh, salient points in this timeline, but these are the ones we've talked about. Uh, I know in the chat, uh, when I gave this as a webinar well, about a week or so ago, somebody mentioned Ted Nelson started working on some uh, hypertext stuff independently of Douglas Engelbart around the same time. Uh, but these are some of the key points. So we have hypertext and we have Wikipedia and Wikipedia gave us some lightweight syntax for, uh, for marking up text and creating and linking concepts. The Wikilinks are are a very lightweight set thing to say, by the way, this thing that I mentioned, it's a thing. And if you click on this thing, you can learn more about that thing. Uh, we've got Markdown we, uh, giving us uh, syntax for, for plain text. Uh, we get graphs. And so I adopted a lot of these ideas in the first real like knowledge management tool uh, that I dove into. And it was, uh, it, it, had a, it was a personal knowledge graph. It combined hypertext, Markdown, Wikilinks. It would build everything into a graph and um, a lot of similar ideas. It was almost there for me. And uh, in fact, this here is my, uh, is, my, is my foam graph right now. This is uh, everything that I've connected, that I've created. Um, and it was, it's, uh, foam is essentially sort of like a free open source, uh, poor man's, if you will, like Rome research. So it's essentially just markdown files and VS code with a collection of plugins to sort of make it all work. Uh, and, I, and I liked it, but one of the challenges was it introduced friction. It almost felt like I was creating a personal wiki. Like every time I mentioned something, I felt compelled to go and dive into that new foam bubble and actually just kind of define what this thing is and, and build this new area. Um, it didn't, it didn't have this backward and forward linking that would have been useful that I could just mention something somewhere. And then later when I'm looking at that topic or area that it would just find that as a backlink and just say, oh, here's all the places you've referenced this thing. And, um, but because it was my files and my data in Markdown, which is a fairly standardized syntax, it was really easy to pour it away when I finally discovered uh, Logseek. Come on. Come on. There we go. And it put all of these pieces together into one tool. And this was the, uh, this is, this is how Matt Stein described it to me. Cause I said, I'm using foam. I'm using foam quite, quite happily. Give me the elevator pitch. Why should I, why should I switch to Logseek? Why should I invest in another tool? And he says, he says, it's not just an editor, an outlining tool, a to-do manager, or an integration of those things. It's a platform for solving, solving knowledge management problems. And it's, it's a pretty damn interesting approach to the problem, if you ask me. Take a bunch of markdown files in a directory structure. Create an opinionated index of lists appearing in those files. And add, add, apply special semantics to syntax, like later is a task. Key colon colon value is a block or a page property and build a graph database under the hood, make it queryable with data log. Render the results of the queries directly in the editor and allow editing of the results to pass through to the underlying data of the disk. It's pretty mark remarkable the more you think about it and the more you play with it. So giants like Engelbart and Timbers Lee gave us practical hypermedia. 
Tools like OneNote, Evernote, et cetera, gave us multimedia. Tools like Workflowy gave us blocks and more granular, malleable units of knowledge to work with and structure. Uh, and, and all of these tools allowed our notes to become informal and open-ended. And backlinking gives us action-oriented notes and gives us more ways to find things in a way where the structure emerges. Now, when I was using foam, I would mainly just capture things. I would, I would, I've, if I was researching a subject, I would capture my research there. And then I would try to normalize this in the graph, which it turns out was a mistake. Um, and, but it was largely these bubbles, these, these topics, these concepts that I was working with. With LogSeq, the heart of it is the journal. So in fact, if you open up LogSeq, you're gonna start with uh, a blank page. Close all this out for a minute. Nope, back to my journal. You're gonna, you're gonna just start with a blank page. And I just, when I started before I really had any kind of meaningful workflow, I just had this open on a, on a window on my machine and I just would capture things. So, you know, maybe I'm researching, uh, you know, build a second brain. And I'll just mention this topic that I'm researching. Maybe I found um, uh, maybe I found a book. Maybe I found a blog post. And again, because it's because it's markup, I can I can just uh, create that hyperlink, and I can digest now my most salient points. Uh, so I can say notes, uh, and I can I can capture my notes. So whatever notes, right? Uh, Resummarize other notes, et cetera. And I can just capture these things and it's under today. So now, now I've got some log of what I've done. And not only that, the structure starts to emerge. If I go to this building a second brain, which it turns out is a book, um, and, I, and, and in fact, this, these, are, these are a lot of my notes, not all of them, but a lot of my notes from the book itself, you'll see all these linked references. Researching, building a second brain, here's my book, here's my notes. I can uh, go in and look, maybe looking at these notes in the context of all of this, maybe I wanna add one more thing. And that's gonna pull through to the other, the other area. Uh, now, this is one of the things I love about LogSeq as well, this, this backlinking, uh, is that we can start to obsess now, does this need to be an entity? Does that need to be an entity? Does this need to be some kind of name reference? Does that need to be some uh, name reference? Let it emerge. So if I go back to my journal now, and maybe I go back, uh, let's jump back to yesterday. And I'm going to say building a second brain um, notes. I didn't even I didn't even annotate that as a as a as a as a wiki link. It's just a topic that I named, and then the next day, in my journal, I actually made this sort of a named entity. Well, if I jump back into this document now, I have my linked references where I've named it, and it's created those backlinks with context. It also now has unlinked references. Because before I said, this is, this is just a topic. The next day I say, this is a named entity. And it will just retroactively fill my graph and make those connections without me having to worry about it, think about it, obsess about it, anything like that. And at any point when I'm, when I'm trying to distill all this information, maybe into this talk, and there's some things in here that I want, maybe in my talk, so if I, if I create a, uh, a new page and I'll just call it, uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, PKM LogSeq Methods and Madness. And I want to talk about the code method. Well, I could copy and paste things. I can do a lot of things or I can jump over here to my notes and I can copy a ref and paste that directly in my document, or I can block embed it. I can copy that block as a URL. 
or I can actually just copy it as markdown or text or HTML or whatever else. So I want to copy a block embed. I'm going to go back to here and I'm just going to put the entire thing in here. So I've got a GUID identifying that entire block and everything underneath it. And when I come out of edit mode, it just renders. And again, if I make a change here, that's going to flow through to the source. So everything stays in sync, everything stays together, your structure emerges. And the most beautiful thing is I can just capture what resonates, what, what stands out to me. I can put it in my journal in bullet points and just sub points as I'm going through my day. I'm in this meeting, here are my notes on the meeting and I can find it all of these different ways. Now, some people, there's, there's some discussion. Some people will just put everything in the journal and you can do this, right? This block structure and because you have these blocks and sub blocks as, as the units of your, of your information, uh, sometimes we'll just do that and just keep everything in there. And if we ever navigate into a topic, it'll just give us all of the linked and unlinked references. Sometimes we wanna go put things in dedicated pages. Um, and so a simple set of rules, there's a, there's a, great, uh, uh, a great YouTube channel if you wanna get more into the nuts and bolts of the tool and the how-tos and all of that. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called One Stuttering Mind. And I've actually got a link to a playlist at the end of these slides. And if you download the slides, uh, you'll be able to get those as well. But, uh, but he says, you know, use your journal for micro inputs, uh, you know, your tweets and your toots, your short articles, videos, links, things that you just wanna capture random thoughts, to-do items, things that while you're working, while you're in flow, do you ever have that happen? You're in flow and you're in the middle of something and it just reminds you of that other thing. And what do you do? Do you get out of flow and start working on that other thing? Do you, do you say, okay, I'm gonna remember that and keep in flow? Or I, I've done both and both of them kind of derail me. You know, or, or one doesn't derail me, but whatever it was I need to remember, I forget. And so what I'll do is I'll just throw those little like, oh, I need to come back to this. I throw it in Logseek and I keep going because now I know it's not going to disappear. It's not going to be out of, out, of, uh, out of mind. So I'll throw those things in there. Stream of consciousness stuff. Um, for pages, the bigger inputs, you know, if I'm making notes on a session at a conference, if I'm, if I'm storing my highlights uh, from the book, recurring meetings, I'll put my notes in there. Uh, anything processed that, you know, part of our, our, part of the second brain process is not only capturing all this stuff, but internalizing it and distilling it into part of our unique perspective and our knowledge that, that we can either keep here or keep in our second brain, larger write-ups, things like that. So, and it's, it's not a big deal to move things from a journal to a page. I can, I can cut that whole block and paste it into a page. I can embed that reference and leave it there. I can, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Uh, or I, I can even do that from the page. So uh, I, I will show you what I typically do is in here, uh, I don't remember where I put that, that block embed. Oh yeah, so, so I've got this in my link reference. Um, I can just copy a block in bed now and leave this in my journal now that I'm on the page and I can just, um, you know, I can just go in here and say uh, other notes and throw that embed in there. And now I'm not too worried about my, my link references. I've got, I've got everything covered. I haven't, I haven't corrupted my journal. I still have this nice uh, log of what I've done. And, and I can move things around. And there are also plugins that you can get that will, uh, that will move, but I prefer the, the, either the reference or the, blo the block ref or the block embed. So one of the challenges though, when we start talking about, uh, talking about this stuff is, in fact, I talked to a, uh, an attendee last night. He says, he said, I saw your webinar about LogSeq. I'm really excited. I have it. And uh, I, have, I have a week's worth of empty journals now. Okay, well, we could do better, and it's it, and and we and the key thing is not to psych ourselves out. But I am convinced that keeping a devlog will make you a better better developer, a better architect. It has definitely helped that for me, 
And the way Matt thinks about it, he says, do you want to internalize your learnings forever? Do you want to discover unconscious patterns that you'd like to eliminate? Uh, do you want to have an easier time writing your self-review each year? And you know, a lot of the people who try to start writing a daily devlog, they fizzle out after a few weeks at most, because uh, it's not about what you write down, it's about what you do with it. So there's a lot of benefits here. It's going to clarify your thinking. Uh, because when you by writing your thoughts down, you clarify your thinking, you crystallize them, and you start to build associations in your first brain. Uh, when you summarize your writings, you build long term awareness. Uh, and by analyzing your summaries, you can discover these unconscious patterns. And it might sound like a heavy list, but honestly, the hardest part is just getting started, just continuing to show up. And the rest of it is rather mechanical, as Matt says. Uh, I mean, I showed you how quickly all this graph starts to build and connect. And that's really when it, what it comes down to. So, okay, keeping a devlog, what should I write down? Uh, starts with whatever your instincts tell you might be useful later. Um, <clears throat> so like I've kept track of pull requests I've submitted, PRs I've approved, uh, it helps start reconstruct a story of what I've done throughout the work. Uh, when I journal interactions with somebody, I, I'll link to that person's note. And over time, I can see who I've collaborated with and what we've worked on together. So six things to put in your dev in your in your daily dev log. Uh, interesting learning resources. Ideally, take a minute and summarize the salient points. Because, you know, it, it's, it's um, uh, you know, I love this turn of phrase in the building a second brain book. Don't think of it as taking notes. Thinking of, think of it as giving notes to your future self. So, you know, I don't know about you, but, uh, but past Michael is generally a jerk. <laughs> There's just certain days I'm just like, thanks past Michael. Um, maybe past, uh, past you uh, has the potential to be kinder. Uh, so when you find this like great blog post or video or whatever else, Take a minute, summarize those bullet points. Summarize the key points in the takeaway, the things that stand out, the things that surprise you, the things that inspire you. Listen to your intuition. Try not to capture everything, but capture like, ooh, the bits that made you go, ooh, the bits that made you go, huh? The bits that you disagreed with, the bits that surprised you. You, you know, those, the, 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 the essence of the, the thing. And then that way, when you come back, you, you don't, you like, oh, there's a blog post, cool. I don't have time to read. 2,500 words, but you can get the gist of it. And, and uh, in the book, the Building a Second Brain book, he talks about progressive summarization, which is, which is kind of an interesting tactic. But in, any interesting learning resources, things you want to come back to later, um, either as to-do items to read in the future, because I have a collection of things that I want to read, but I don't have time to, and they're connected to different areas of, uh, or different, different resources and topics that I care about. But if I do read something and I want to retain it or sit in a conference talk and I want to retain it, uh, I put that in there and I try to bullet point uh, ideas and musings for the future. You know, I talked about this before when ideas come up, I don't want to have to context switch, but I want to put them somewhere where I can find them when the time is right. And then I don't worry about it. And I just move on with with my flow uh, pull requests. I talked about this um, almost any workplace uh, work product I deliver. Uh, requires uh, some kind of flow through Git or something like it. Uh, my list of PRs is like my personal task level Kanban board. A lot of it's the work in progress that I'm connected to. And it helps me, again, easily reconstruct a story what I've, of what I've done throughout the week. Uh, personal inter interactions. I make a uh, note of every personal interaction I have, scheduled or otherwise. Uh, I keep a page for each person. Uh, and I have uh, I have a template in my in my GitHub repo where you can kind of see some of the points that I use, you know, modify it for yourself. But um, but I link that page for my daily notes, and I'll just say, oh, you know, I talked to whoever, talked to Matt Stein, bracket bracket Matt Stein, and here's my bullet points there. And then later on, when I'm looking at the Matt Stein page, I've got that with the date that's inherited from the daily journal blog. Uh, and over that time, you know, I, I describe. Uh, patterns of interaction. I describe, you know, things that I've learned because every now and again, uh, you know, when I'm working with teams or other teams or clients or whoever, you know, I'll just, I'll make some observation. I'll just say, oh, you know, this is a good strategy to, to speak to this person because that's one of the things that we have to do in, as architects is we need to tailor our message and our speech and our style of delivery to the audience. The way we talk to developers is going to be different to the way we talk to the business. 
And the way we talk to the business is gonna be different to the way we might talk to customers. And, and, and then even within those amorphous categories, there are different personalities and different things and different, different drivers uh, for different business people. They, they, every, every business person has a different hot button. And so I try to present my, my architecture, whatever else through that lens. I'm like, oh, you care about speed to market? Okay, I'm gonna frame the benefits of this technological change in terms of speed to market instead of, oh, this is gonna make the developers happier because this guy doesn't care about making the developers happier. He cares about speed to market. And you've got a different manager and this other manager wants to, uh, you know, wants to create a better culture. And so, you know, I'm gonna say, this is how it's gonna uh, make the developer experience so much better and has the side effect of speed to market. And, you know, but I, but I don't try to remember all of these things because I can't. And in our job today, if you can keep it all in your head, you're probably not doing enough. Uh, but I have all of this information, uh, project actions, uh, a narrative, running narrative of the things I'm working on. I organize by project in LogSeq as well. And I have a query that shows me active projects, someday projects, archived, completed projects. And, and this helps me a lot because like going into 2023, I can now, and actually, if you're going to take a picture, I'll pull the last one up too. Um, uh, going into the projects, um, you know, going into 2023, there's a lot of potential projects. And for a while coming into Q4, it was just, there's all these things that I could do and I can, I, I'm struggling just to even make sense of it. And now it's like, here's all my projects. Here's scope, goals, priorities, and I can start to move them around. And I can, and I can from that make sense of it and say, this one and this one, these are my wildly important goals. This one is, uh, if you, to borrow the four disciplines of execution parlance, this one, nice to have this one someday. And what is beautiful is every time I have an idea on the someday, I put it in my second brain and I know it's not going to get lost because because if you're like me, there are times where you're going to get inspired in different areas. And that usually doesn't correlate to when you need to be focusing over there. Like I'm the type of person, if there's something really, really important I need to do, all of a sudden my brain is going to say, you know, what's even more important, reorganizing your bookshelf. You know, that old hard drive that you took out of your old computer that's just called MISC? Go through it, sort those 20,000 files in your, do in your old documents folder and see what you need. And so if I have an idea that goes there, I'm, I'm not jumping around between project to project to project to project like a hyperactive fleet. I can, I can focus with the confidence that I'm not losing these other things. So hopefully this list helps you get past, oh, and, and uh, uh, perplexing puzzles. I also make a note of anything that surprises me. Anything that confounds me could be a strange program behavior, could be a bug, could be a blocker, a production issue, anything unexpected. And, and when I review these periodically, I ask myself, how can I use what I've learned to improve my mental models? But like I said, hopefully this stuff helps you get past the starting line. Do this faithfully for seven months and several months and see where it takes you. A uh, couple other things, uh, add some structure. And this is another game changer for me to my day because I wake up in the morning, what am I gonna do? And then I, and then I finally get some momentum around 11 or 12 o'clock in the day um, because I, I foolishly decided that, well, what I really need to do is just warm my fingers up. I'm gonna compose a few tweets or I'm gonna, uh, or maybe I need to warm my brain up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play Wordle and then I finish Wordle and I'm gonna go download an app because there's only one Wordle a day. And before I knew it, you know, I'm whatever. So uh, one of the, and then I finally get some momentum and then I finish something and then what? And then it starts all over again. So I, uh, I'm gonna show you another feature in LogSeq here. I'm gonna go back to my, uh, I'm gonna go back to my daily journal, not that one. I'm gonna go to this one. Uh, I can always get to them here from journals. And, uh, and LogSeq has all kinds of capabilities. And we could, we could spend a day just going through all the things you can do. Don't worry about what you can do. Worry about what you need to do. Every time, every time you run into a situation, it's like, hey, I really need to do X or it would really be nice if I could do Y. That's when go out and look for the thing. Look for a plugin, look for, 
look for a tutorial, something like that. Because again, uh, this is a tool. This is not, don't turn this into the meta work that's more interesting, but less valuable than the real work. Um, but templates, another really valuable thing. Uh, I actually have a page called template. And in here, um, I just give that block a block property, template colon colon and a name, template including parent colon colon false. So basically, if I bring in this template, it's not going to pull in, it's not going to pull in H1 books. I've got a template for projects, I've got a template for um, uh, team members, I've got a template for meetings, I've got a template for my one on ones, I've got a template for my daily journal, and this is the one I'm going to show you. I've got a template for my weekly journal reflection. I've got a template for taking notes at a conference talk, which I'm going to show you how to do so you can take this and actually keep that other 80% that would otherwise be gone. Uh, and I'll show you my workflow for that in a little bit. Uh, so I really just capture this. I give it these properties. And then anything beneath this becomes, um, anything beneath this becomes part of that template. And so when I'm in my journal, I, I bring up the sort of command prompt by typing a forward slash. And I get, here's all the things that I can do. I can say, well, oh, page reference, a page embed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can upload an asset. If I don't know my markdown, uh, this is slightly harder than typing hash symbols. Time and date, today, tomorrow, current time, date picker, task now, later, to do, doing, done, waiting, cancel, deadline, priorities, et cetera. I can add queries and so on, embed HTML, embed YouTube URL. What's the player in my page? And then when I'm watching this video and taking notes, I can embed the YouTube timestamp for the, for the notes that I'm taking. At this point, I learned this thing. This is why I hate learning from videos because I can't, because I don't, I lose that hyper media capability. Um, embed Twitter, turn into a page, mermaid diagram. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff in here, but what I care about is a template. So I'm gonna say template. And I'm going to grab my daily journal template and boom. This is how I start my day every single day. What's my goal? You know, uh, survive day one of our comp. Three things. What's going to make today a win? Uh, you know, deliver my talks. Uh, make sure I have time to eat. I don't know. You know, uh, have a drink with, uh, with old friends. And then... I break down my entire day in terms of time boxing. So uh, I'm a fan of the Pomodoro technique. This is why I've got a 25 minute timer in my log seek. Um, now this doesn't mean that I wanna work from 6 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. But it means that, that I'm thinking about my day in 30 minute blocks as I go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add in here the breaks I'm gonna take. I'm gonna try to give every minute a job. And so it'll, you know, the Pomodoro technique allows me to start without being overwhelmed, to stop even though there's more to do, knowing I can come back to it. Do you have this template in your GitHub? I do. I do have the template in my GitHub. Um, and, and so in here, I'm going to try to give every minute a job. Now, I don't always plan every detail of my day because the reality is we, we react a lot. But I know I have a meeting with, uh, let's say, Tim Berglund. Berglund. He's not in there yet. Uh, and I might just go ahead and take notes for the meeting. Uh, I need the template first. Uh, I think I have a meeting template. Maybe not. Uh, I have one of my other, other graph. But, uh, or I'll just capture notes, or I'm going to work on the, uh, you know, work on the production issue or work on the whatever. And just as I'm going, I'm capturing my notes in here. And, um, and so once I've planned out my day, and I've got like this, this structure emergent, you know, I've got, I start here. What's my goal? One sentence. What's going to make, what, what, am I, what do I want to accomplish today? Uh, today's target, three things. What's going to make today a win? How am I going, you know, so how am I going to break down my day? with time to work, downtime, uh, deal with my schedule. So I don't get in that situation where I say, oh, the meeting's in 30 minutes. So I guess I just sit here and, 
and, and scroll on social media for 30 minutes because I'm just waiting for the meeting to start. Like I've got that structure. Um, and one of the nice things as well is as I'm going, when I do switch off, I use the, the Hemingway technique to, to leave myself a breadcrumb for the next day. So if I'm, if I'm finishing up and I've got something not done, I'm gonna just say to do, um, uh, finish this article uh, tomorrow. And then when I go into tomorrow's journal, if I can remember what, that's the wrong, that's the wrong plugin. When I go to, that's the wrong day. When I go to tomorrow's journal, there it is. And, and, I, and I know exactly how to pick up from yesterday so I can shut down and enjoy the rest of my night, enjoy my downtime without obsessing about all the things that I didn't finish today. Um, those little thoughts that come in, those little emails of things I need to get to later, but I don't wanna drop the ball on, I just throw them in my inbox and I reorganize and plan them and put them in projects later on. Uh, other things that I just remember that I don't wanna forget, I throw them in there. At the end of the day, I reflect, you know, what are the things I learned today? Um, so this was a tip from the webinar the other day, uh, throw in gratitude. You know, what am I grateful for? It's good for your mental health. Uh, what am I, what am I, what are my wins? You know, uh, what can I look on today and say, yeah, today was a win. Um, so a couple other points to still regularly every, uh, every week, I create like a two to three paragraph summary of my daily notes. Uh, there's a weekly reflection template in there that you can use or not, or modify or whatever. Um, I try to make note of any patterns I notice, uh, incidents that occur, discoveries. Um, and then when I'm tackling a new project and all my memories faded, um, uh, you know, I can come back to those and, and, and recall them. Uh, I can refer to that, uh, to the topic note, you know, maybe it's setting up, a, setting up an EKS cluster or setting or dealing with this like one-time issue with, uh, you know, spinning up a new database in this particular case. Uh, another thing is uh, task management. We talked a little bit about there and showing the to-dos, dates, how they backlink, uh, future dates. There's different, um, uh, different statuses for your to-dos. You could see from that, uh, that task list. And uh, a lot of times I, uh, I don't do this, but some people do. Uh, they, have, they, they create queries and actually build essentially a Kanban board in uh in log seek using the queries uh i'm a big i have a personal i have a physical kanban board that's sort of how i roll but i do just find my to-dos and i and i sync those from time to time but i like having i like having the thing that i can look at and move there's something about making this tangible from time to time uh learning in log seek this is uh this is one of my favorite things to do so uh, so I, the notes that i have from the book when i read it it does not have my uh, my highlights, but I but I can connect LogSeq to Readwise to get my highlights from the Kindle. Uh, I just have it pulled into that particular copy of the notes, but but uh, that's not that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't mean to hit escape. Silly me. I meant to leave this running. So where was I? Learning in LogSeq. Here we go. Thank you for your patience. And we're here. And then I'm gonna jump over to here. So let's go to this page. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Oh, that's wrong too. Ah, it was all going so well. Let's see, it was all going so well. Slideshow. Monitor, use presenter view. <laughs> oh, we're almost there. Let's try that. Okay, almost. Oh, I know what I need to do. Uh, 
Ah, thank you. <clears throat> All right, there we are. Muscle memory. Whoops. Uh, so let's see. Let me get rid of that. So I have uh, one of the first things I'll do, and this is going to make me unpopular with no fluffs uh, presenters, by the way, because we're we're almost always evolving our content up to the moment that we present it, including today, right before I start, I'm like, oh, one more slide, I'm gonna throw it in there. Uh, but you can, the, the slides are theoretically available for download on the site. Usually they're not uploaded until after the talk. And so this is where I'm gonna get in trouble. But uh, uh, one of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a template and grab my conference talk template and go into my metadata. I, I, I do this so my template doesn't show up in queries. I mean, you can do fancier things, uh, but we can, you know, I'm gonna just fill in this metadata. So I'm gonna say this is PKM, log seek methods and madness. Speaker is Michael Carducci. Conference is ArcConf. Uh, date is, I'm just going to say today, location is Clearwater, Florida, and the abstract is whatever, right? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add my slides, upload an asset, browse, desktop, uh, where did I put it? I literally saved this like right before the talk. It might, it might actually be in the assets already in here. Yeah, it's actually in here. So I'm just going to upload it from there, even though it, I download, say it's in my downloads folder, whatever, I've got it. And now I have an embedded reference to a PDF. And as I'm as as the presenter is going through the slides, because we've probably done this at a no fluff talk in the past, downloaded the slides and we look at them and it's like, OK, Mike's Bitmoji, I forgot. What was the point of that? And then the irony sets in. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, so maybe I want to uh, take something and. Uh, maybe put a little highlight in here. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to highlight that and I'm going to copy that reference. And in my notes, now I have a reference to a highlight on the page and I can make my notes. And when I click on this, it takes me back to the PDF. Even if I close this out later on when I'm reviewing my notes from the conference talk, click back to that slide, to that highlighted thing. Um, you know, as I go through, I can just I can just capture uh, any references I can you know depending on the the format of the PDF. If you if there's embedded text, you can hide you can do highlights in the text. I do the same thing with PDFs. Um, it's it's basically killed. Uh, I, I used to love reading physical books because I love writing in the margins and dog earing pages and doing all of this. But now more and more, I'm just like give it to me in a PDF, and I'm gonna do it all in here. Uh, but I can go in here, add all of my notes, and uh, you know anything that I might want to come back to in the future uh, as I go through the talk. And in fact, uh, I also did this uh, recently, uh, the previous conference, Tech Leader Summit, I did this with Brian Sletton's uh, future, future of IT talk. And what I really wished I had, had done was actually just recorded my screen as I was making notes during his talk. <coughs> Because uh, the other thing that I was doing was I, I because he didn't have the slides live yet. Uh, I just uh, now I have one of these like ridiculous portable second monitors, uh, Christmas present, early Christmas present. Thank you, Kate. Um, and so I had in my other screen, I had the the Zoom thread. Now, if you're going to do this, tip number one: don't join the audio. It's going to be super disruptive. Don't do it. Um, everybody will look at you. <laughs> and you will want to pack up your things and leave and never come back, trust me. Um, tab it, you know, join audio with computer. Oh, nope. Right. 
Um, so I just got the stream of his screen share and I just got my, my stipping tool and I would just take screenshots and put them in there as I went and make notes on that. Cause if I, if I, if I do that, I can just paste in an image at any point, just control V image and there it is. And I can resize it and do whatever else I want with it. I can add in links, all of that. Um, but just as you're going, have this up, have the slides up if they're available um, and make notes as you go and connect them back to the slides. And you've got more of those associations. They're going to help you recall even more. Uh, I think I actually wanted to be there. So a couple other things. Uh, so I do the same thing with books. I have a book template and, um, and in fact, if I, if I jump into here, uh, let's just create a new page. So I'm gonna close out of here. I'm gonna create a new page. I'm gonna call it reading list. And, oh, I've already written the query, cool. Um, so there are basic queries uh, where I can, I can say here, show me the books that I've read. Uh, I, can, I can create another query and uh, Maybe for, actually, before I do that, I'm going to say uh, books to read. And in here, I'm going to create another query. And I'm just going to create the type. So I'm going to say and books with the status of uh, uh, like read or to read or whatever I wanted to find that status is. Because these are now just page properties. And I get that. Maybe I want a list. Maybe I want a table view. And maybe I only want to show certain columns. So uh, maybe it's block. Maybe it's tags. I don't care about format. I don't care about that. Uh, I want the cover art. And maybe I want the, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, type, title, author. Yeah, I'll take, take the rest of this out of here. I don't care about that. And, and I can just kind of render this look, list of books. Uh, I guess I, for the status of this one, I want uh, uh, to read as a status. And so the books I've read, the books I need to read, books I'm currently reading, uh, I, kinda, I can create that. I do the same with tasks, with uh, projects, with teams, with meetings, basically anything that you, uh, that you want to keep track of. Now, uh, there are some plugins that I use. Uh, one of the plugins I use is the Pomodoro plugin. Uh, I mostly use it on the road. At home, I have a nice physical Pomodoro timer that, uh, that, that Kate got me as a, a birthday present uh, some uh, about a year or so ago. It's really cool. It has, uh, it's Nixie, anyway, uh, whatever. Uh, I use the calendar plugin. That, that calendar plugin that I use is, is this one. Uh, no, it's uh, this one here, the open calendar that allows me just to jump to any log day. And the other thing I like is it gives me little dots to show me where I've been consistent, it helps me kind of build that accountability because I can see all the days where I've written in my journal. And a lot of times I'll look at this and I'll just go backfill um, just because I like having that streak. You know, one of the things about having a metric like that is, is it, it gives some accountability. We all play differently when we keep score. Uh, I use the Write Good plugin. I, if, I'm, if I'm just writing, I like having grammar checks and spelling and things like that when I'm trying to output something. Um, I, I use this to-do plugin. Um, uh, I like the lock screen. I like the idea of being able to lock my screen because I sometimes I write about people. And if I'm in the office and I have that up, I want to be able to just like blanket, but keep it kind of top of mind. Uh, I do like this mind map, uh, this mind map plugin, because sometimes when I'm, when I'm really early in an idea that I want to explore, uh, uh, maybe I just want to start this way. You know, I want to, I just, I want to start just by doing kind of a mind mapping uh, exercise, or maybe I want to visualize this differently as a mind map, uh, just to kind of look at the look at the uh, the problem differently. So I use that mind map plugin from time to time. Uh, now a couple things with the plugins: be careful because some of them have opinions on on how you should uh, leverage your graph and how you should structure it. So not all of these opinions are compatible. Uh, it's easy to go into the marketplace. There is a plugin marketplace, 
and um, it's easy to go in here and just look at these and say, ooh, that looks good, 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 that looks good. That looks good. Um, I did that and it did, it did run into some issues. So normal, now I've gotten to the point where I wait until I have a problem to solve and then I'll go to the marketplace and see if there's a solution. And if not, I can usually get, get, get something going good enough with templates and queries. There are advanced queries uh, where you can use data log to write very sophisticated, sophisticated queries and do some cool things. But, um, but we've got we've to gotta keep going, we've got to wrap up and I want to talk about building a second brain because, so we've got a dev log. We've got this, but how do we turn this set of tools into, into a, a, a dedicated second brain? And, you know, like I said, we've, we've gone from knowledge workers to information hoarders. Uh, the average person's consumption, I mentioned this, 34 gigabytes. Uh, a separate study cited by the Times where they published that stat uh, was a hundred, is that a uh, average person today consumes 174 full newspapers worth of information every day. You know, there was a time when we would just read one newspaper. Um, and a lot of this information, some of it we need, but most of it we don't need yet. And so we need to package it for our future selves. You know, when I, when I said in the beginning, I wanted that Newton message pad, what I really wanted was a better memory. And I even started reading books and learning memory techniques. I used to teach a memory talk. I don't know if anybody's ever sat in this, but, uh, but I, I would teach these talks to developers. And um, I learned some things. One is that memory is a write on read medium. That means that if you wanna remember something, you have to recall it. And if you don't recall it for a long enough time, your brain automatically garbage collects it. It's like, oh, you don't need this. And, uh, and that's great for the things that we do every day, but it's bad for the things that we do seldom. And now I can put these things in my, in, my, in my second brain and know it'll never get garbage collected. And um, it's those obscure problems, it's all those other things. So with our journal and our graph, it's easy to find these things and there's more than one path to get there. And they're all natural and it's very low friction. Because um, there are things that I, I don't really want to learn, but remember I use, uh, another thing we haven't even touched on is like log seeks, as I'm learning things, if there are things that I want to commit to memory, I start creating flashcards in my notes. And then I can go through my flashcards and, and do spaced repetition of things. But I've got this supplement to my memory. You know, Vanderveer Bush said, consider a future device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility is an enlarged intimate supplement to his memory. I have this. I have my Memex. It fulfills Vanderveer's Bush, Vanderveer Bush's vision from 80 years ago, right? 70, I can't math, it's too early. So we have our second brain and, and, and we can use this as a second brain. The superpowers of the second brain, are we make our ideas concrete, we reveal new associations between ideas. We can incubate our ideas over time and we can sharpen our unique perspectives. And so a big part of that is not just capturing and not just recalling, but doing the work to distill, to write, if we're not writing, we're not thinking. Uh, and these connections, these cross connections are insanely valuable. Nancy Andreasen wrote in a paper, creative people are better at recognizing relationships, making associations hmm, and connections. And uh, David Epstein in his book, Range, is talking about the, 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 the most valuable people in the future are not the specialists. They are the generalists that can connect ideas from across multiple domains to create novel and creative solutions to today's problems. And that's what we have to be as architects. You know, we've, we've, you know, we've done this part of our career where we get really good at a language or a tool or a framework. But in architecture, we need to widen that. And we need to not even become T-shaped anymore. We need to be that sort of broken comb model where we've got a lot of breadth and varying level of depths in, in all of these different areas. And, and as we solve new problems, we've got to connect all of these things together. Uh, David Epstein and Range said, modern work demands knowledge transfer, the ability to apply knowledge to new situations in different domains. Our most fundamental thought processes have changed to accommodate increasing complexity and the need to derive new patterns. This is long. Rather than rely on familiar ones, our conceptual classification schemes provide a scaffolding for connecting knowledge and making it accessible and flexible. 
So this three stages of personal knowledge man, man, management, remembering, connecting, and creating. Creating is where we're, where we're distilling our insights, where we're deriving new insights. Um, so in the book, uh, in, the in the Building a Second Brain book, the code method is introduced. And code, of course, being an acronym for capture, organize, distill, and express. And it's these four stages that transform this into a personal knowledge graph and into that second brain and into a tool that not only helps you uh, make sense, collect, organize, and find that information, but becomes an indispensable thinking tool, a creative tool, a problem-solving tool. Uh, I got to find the quote from uh, Matt Stein because uh, he says that is that is his number one most in, in, indispensable tool for polymathic knowledge work uh, for the for the work that he does. So the first one, capture, capture what resonates. The solution is to only keep what resonates uh, into a trusted place that you control and leave the rest aside. Uh, these are your trusted knowledge assets. And one of the pitfalls I see people do is they, they start capturing too much. So you wanna capture, you wanna follow some kind of criteria. Does it inspire me? Is it useful? Or will it be useful? Is it, is it personal? Is it surprising? That last one, I like this because information that's not surprising, that means that on some level, I already know it. And so that's a good metric. You know, you don't, they don't have to meet this. This isn't a rubric where it has to meet all these criteria, but these are some points. But in the end, trust your intuition. I think I need to capture this. Do I, do I, do I really need this? Uh, the next step is to organize. So you want to save what you capture for action ability. And when you're organizing for action, it gives you tremendous clarity. So continue, con consider all the new information in terms of utility. Asking this question, how is this going to help me move forward one of my current or future projects? Uh, the next step is to distill. Distill your notes down to their essence. Uh, so in the book, uh, he talks about progressive, distil progressive, uh, progressive highlighting, I think is what he calls it. But every idea has an essence. It's the heart and soul of what's trying to be communicated. So every time you take a note or every time you review your notes, ask yourself this question, how can I make this as useful as possible for my future self? Like I said before, and this is a, this is a quote from the book, think of yourself not just as a taker of notes, but of a giver of notes. You are giving these notes to your future self. And the last one is express, show your work, create something. Uh, information becomes knowledge personal, embodied, verified, only when we put it to use. So shift as much time as possible um, and effort as possible from consuming to creating, taking that, distilling it, summarizing it, um, uh, creating these into shareable artifacts for your team, for your developers, for the business, because that's, that's the real magic. We don't, want, we don't want to just create another worldwide web of documents. We wanna create a body of our knowledge that, that has all the tools that we wish we had. And uh, the other process that, uh, the other, the other uh, organizing methodology that is uh, in the book that Tiago Forte talks about is para. Um, and so it gives you some structure. Uh, it gives you a logical place for any digital note. Uh, you can show by its home how actionable this thing is. It's simple, it's easy to maintain. And uh, it's quick, you can quickly implement it in any tool. It doesn't have to be locks, it can be anything. So P-A-R-A -A stands for projects, areas, resources, and archives. And uh, Diego developed Para and teaches it in his Building a Second Brain course. Um, so one of the things about organizing by project, projects have a beginning and an end. They have a clear outcome and it creates some cross-pollination. Organizing by project instead of some artificial indexing system gives you that benefit. Projects are buckets of goal-oriented tasks. Uh, these could be current stories you're implementing, could be operational incidents you're working on, could be training classes that you're working on, conferences that you're attending. Areas are buckets of ongoing activity with current quality standards. So these are relationships with your manager, your peers, your partners, your friends, your professional development as an engineer, uh, typical guilds you participate in. Uh, one on, uh, so for this, uh, one of the things I have is, is I have, I have a one-on-one -on -one template for every one-on-one -on -one 
uh, uh, meeting that I would have with the team. I have meeting templates where I can capture things and I can, and I can cross link to future actionability. I can create to do's. So I know when I leave that meeting, I don't have to spend any more cognitive load on it because it's in my second brain. Uh, and when I come back and when I do performance reviews or anything else on my teams, I can look at all of those meetings and I summarize them from time to time and kind of capture the, the, the core essence of like where we are with that person. Because again, that's part of that express step. Uh, resources are buckets of useful or otherwise interesting things. So they can be useful code snippets, links to useful websites, things that you've learned about programming languages, libraries, frameworks. So, so my resources really are topics that I'm interested in. And that's where, the, and, and resources I express as pages as well. And archives, um, basically any inactive items from the previous three areas, software you're no longer shipping, teams you've left, training classes that you've, com you've completed. Um, and so for my projects, I have queries and I just have an archive status. And so they either show up in doing, to do, or done, essentially. I mean, there's, it's broken down a little more, like, there's a little more granularity, but that's the heart of it. Um, sometimes I take things out of my, uh, my graph entirely. So I have another graph, which is just my personal work from my last job. I've left, I've moved on, but, um, uh, and of course I have two, two sets of, of notes there because uh, you have to be mindful of IP and that's the other thing. And I'll talk a little bit about that before we close because I keep, I had two graphs. I have my work graph, which is which I have let go of, and and I have thoughts around you know I, any 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 research I've done around there. But anything that was related to my old project is exported off to a separate graph. I can get it if I need it. Uh, anything non-proprietary, um, I can get if I need it. But I've taken it out of my main graph. Uh, so you can archive whole graphs, or you can just give things an archive status, or however you want to do. Uh, but I do want to talk about IP on that note as we're coming to, the, to time. Remember that anything that touches your, com your work computer can be considered the, comp the property of the company. Um, if you want to take your company agnostic technology notes with you when you leave, don't take them on your work computer. There's a reason that I would take my personal laptop with me to work and I have my work laptop at work too when I go to the office because there are things that I would I would do there, and there are things that I would do here, and I sometimes I would even just make paper notes and then consolidate on on my time on a lunch break or whatever else. Um, but uh, I also should go without saying, but make sure that company confidential data doesn't leak into your personal notes. Um, now, what the key thing that I found indispensable was to use the same digital knowledge management practices in your work in your personal life. The cognitive load of having two different systems is high and trust me, I've tried, it's just not worth it. And things get lost when you're constantly switching modes. You want this to be friction free. Uh, and even if you can't integrate the data with the same, try to use the same tools everywhere. I chose Loxie because it was the most powerful tool uh, and was also most likely to make it through the OSS approval. Uh, some of these are, that's actually, that's actually Matt's note, uh, make it through our OSS approval flow and be installable through our dev tool packages manager. Your mileage may vary. We are at time. If you want my demo graph that has my templates, that has some notes, that has books, uh, some of the things that we demonstrated, talked about, and some of the things we did, it's on GitHub, github.com slash Carducci slash logseek demo graph. You want to download, download logseek, logseek.com. And uh, there are a few more resources I want to make you aware of. Um, so yeah, the, there's a link to the demo graph, uh, the book, Building a Second Brain, Easily, I, I've read probably 50 books this year, easily the most impactful book I've read. Um, there's a link to uh, Building a Second Brain Foundation course. Uh, I talked to Matt about this. He's been suggesting I do it. And he said it's, uh, it's, the only, it's the only course that he paid for that he didn't have, that had zero regrets for paying for. Um, there's uh, Building a Second Brain, Brain Community Membership. Uh, those two links, by the way, uh, so, uh, so those are Matt's links and, you know, full disclosure, they are affiliate links, but, but this is, but Matt is not the type of person to, uh, to plug something because, because of the affiliate link, that's an incidental thing. He wouldn't, uh, and, and I, he, I, and a bunch of other speakers are, uh, are, are, are very, 
inspired by this work. And then also I talked about this uh, tutorial. I mentioned one, one stuttering not mind. Uh, I've got a link to a Logsy playlist to get a little more in depth on the tool and some best practices. So, you know, a few more notes from Matt. My PKM journey, even when practice hasn't been great, has made me a much more effective engineer and architect. Just intentionally thinking about how I'm organizing and how I'm taking action on the information that's flowing past me has made a tremendous difference. He says, I wanna help others get started on this journey and I wanna accelerate or somehow further enable those already on this journey. One other thing, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't plug Mac's book, Humility Driven Development on LeanPub. And we are at time, this has been a blast. Thank you all so much. And thank you folks on Zoom and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Yes. Uh, pictures or screenshots? What do you do with those? Do you have like, is there like a plugin for? Oh, you just, you, uh, you paste them straight in. And does it translate the contents? Uh, the, like, like language translation? Uh -huh. I th there might be translation plugins. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Kirk, how you doing?